Okay, so welcome everybody to this new season of Immutable Conversations in which we're gonna talk with people related to functional programming about a wide range of topics and you know we're gonna try to keep this uh, simple, to try it, uh, to keep it high level and to talk about uh, things we like. Uh, today I have with me uh, Tomás Reed. He's, uh, I would say, one of the visible heads of functional programming in iOS. He is one of the maintainers of uh, the Bow library for Swift, or I don't know if now I should say like the framework, because now you have like Bow Arc and Bow Light, so uh, you'll tell us a bit about them later. And uh, he works right now as a trainer and a tech lead at 47 Degrees, uh, but I think before he's done like everything possible. He's been doing a PhD, he's been working as a postdoc in, in Oslo, which I guess it's a, quite a change from, from Spain. Uh, and he's been working uh, in founding and, and in several tech companies in Spain. So uh, welcome and thanks for, for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Alejandro. I'm honored to be here. Cool. So, so I know, uh, the idea is that, that we are we want to talk today a bit about, you know, how functional programming is, is becoming uh, more and more used in the in the industry and also, you know, your thoughts about how this looks like and, and you know, how you decided to, to bring uh, this to Swift, which is, you know, uh, what, what Bo is, is, is adding to the already kind of functional features in, in, in Swift. So, I don't know, I mean... Tell me what what are your are your uh, you know what what do you think why, what do you think that functional programming is is becoming like in in industry when you look at this kind of new languages and like like Swift but also like Kotlin or, or anything which is happening right now. Yes, um, well, uh, at the beginning I started Bow just as a learning exercise uh, for me. I didn't know any functional programming whatsoever uh, three years ago, but uh, yeah, I, I saw that uh, the way that I was doing programming before was not completely satisfying to me. Uh, it was working, but still I needed something. And I was seeing that uh, modern languages were adopting new features that were coming from functional programming. For instance, if we uh, can uh, name a few of them, we can see uh, higher order functions. And to me, this is one of the best additions to most uh, modern uh, programming languages. Even we missed this feature so much that we came up with uh, an entire set of uh, design patterns to cover these uh, shortcomings in, in languages. Um, we invented uh, things like the listener, the observer pattern, the, uh, the strategy and all these things. Yeah, I, I also, I mean, I have the same feeling like I remember when I was sort of learning Java and then you had to create these this interfaces and then you had they came with this idea of anonymous interfaces and it became more and more convoluted and, and then suddenly you learn what higher order function is and you say, what, why have you been telling all this to me all this time? Why, 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 why are you hiding the actual concept? Yeah, yeah. exactly. They, they, they were so much ceremony just to hide the fact that uh, you need to pass a function to another function or you need to return a different implementation for, for a, uh, a given function. And this was like a really big win. Uh, it removed so much uh, ceremony from implementing uh, things like uh, a sorting algorithm, for instance, where you can pass different uh, sorting criteria. And uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to do something like that. When, when I started uh, working on Bow. And one of the things that I thought that uh, could benefit uh, more was 
uh, simulating higher candidate types. Okay, so okay, so before before we go on, maybe you can give us a small overview of what we mean by higher candidate types, because I guess that's that's you know higher order function is something that people sort of know nowadays, but higher kind of type is still something which, you know, it's, it's, it's coming from, from far, far from us. Yeah, I, I uh, usually like describing higher order type, uh, higher, yeah, higher kind of types as uh, generics to the next power. And yeah, the generics is another feature that uh, initially came in uh, functional programming languages and then have uh, little by little permea been permeating into other languages. Even uh, the more the most uh, reluctant languages like Go have ended up somehow adopting this uh, feature. And it's a feature that uh, lets us write more generic code um, instead of having to uh, for instance, come up with uh, different implementations depending on the type that you're going to uh, store in an array. You can just abstract over this type that you are uh, storing in, in an array and create an, a generic implementation. And right now, no one thinks of uh, implementing one array for ints and one array of, for strings and one array for something else. You just create a general array, which are typically offered by the um, standard libraries in most uh, languages, and you just uh, start using them. So why should we stop there? We can go farther from there. Okay, so 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 if I understand correctly, sort of we, what we what higher kind of types is going to be like an extension of generic. So of this idea of of having functions which work over several types. So, I mean, the idea of generics, I would say once you learn about it, seems like quite a natural one. So, I mean, it's clear that you have a race of different things and you have trees of the, which hold different things. So, and many of these things like searching or, or ordering are just completely generic once you give enough information. So, so I mean, but what do actually higher kind of type then bring to the table? I mean, what's, what's the extension they, they offer? Yeah, it's a new way of uh, being able to abstract over things. Um, uh, we were using the example of uh, arrays or, or trees, as you mentioned, but uh, languages only uh, let us abstract over the types that are being held inside those uh, structures. But we cannot abstract over the structure itself. You, we cannot abstract over uh, a type that uh, lets us uh, transform its content. So do you have, have like a specific example of, of, you know, what, you know, like a function I would like to abstract over this? Because I know at first for me, it looks weird to think of, you know, I do something for lists and I do something for trees and they seem so different that it seems uh, weird to think about the way. So I don't know if you have an, a more specific example you can share, you know, about when we want to uh, abstract over sort of the data structure, if I understand correctly. Yes, uh, we could be thinking about transforming the contents of, uh, of a structure and we don't mind which type of a structure uh, uh, as long as we know that it can be uh, 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 traversed and uh, we can perform uh, one operation for each uh, item. Or even I can I can show um, an example of uh, writing functions that uh, could be pretty much the same, but uh, that we cannot abstract over their uh, result types. So I'm going to share my screen. Look, so consider these uh, validation functions. Okay. So these are two validation functions that uh, uh, we can use to validate a name or to validate an age. And they can return a valid value or, uh, or an error because maybe here we are validating that the name that we are passed is not empty. And if it is empty, we can return a left hand side of an either value with a corresponding error. Likewise, if the age is under 18, we can return an error uh, telling that the person that we are validating is a minor. 
Okay, so, so he, we, here, here you're following this convention in with like the thing which is not right is the left. So, I mean, when you say exactly. left, that, that just represents the error condition, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We are modeling that this uh, function can either uh, return a validation error or a uint. So whenever something is correct, we return the right-hand side. And whenever something is incorrect, we return the left-hand side. And then we can compose these two functions to validate both fields, uh, name and age. And if everything is correct, we create a person. So we can do that using the map operation that is implemented in, in either. So we validate both uh, name and age. And finally, we can initialize it. Uh, we, we can use these uh, correct values to initialize a person. So the result of all this uh, uh, operation should be either a validation error, which contains the first error that happened during the validation process, or uh, a valid person that we have been able to, to build from the name and the age. Okay, so, so just to clarify things, so the map operation essentially will, will take these two validations, so this can fail or not, and then if they are both correct, it will sort of apply this person initializer and otherwise it will give you back the error, right? So exactly. That, so it the map will is not you back the, black magic. The first it's, error it's... that happened. Okay. Okay. Right. Understood. Good. So there is a, a question here. What happens if I, instead of getting the first error, I would like to get all the errors that happened during the validation process? Good. So uh, according to the Swift uh, type system, we cannot do that with uh, either. We would like to uh, have another type that can uh, perform this uh, kind of error accumulation semantics. So I have another example here where we can use the validated type. And validated lets us uh, accumulate errors in the, in the validation error. So we can uh, implement the same two functions. And if you pay a closer look here, you can see that uh, the body of uh, this function is exactly the same as we had in the previous case. The only difference is that instead of using uh, left and right, we are using invalid and valid. But the structure, the logic here is pretty much the same. And likewise, uh, we have to do the same thing when we are validating the H and we are returning invalid and valid. And then when we want to combine uh, the validation for name and age, it's, uh, again, the implementation is the same. We use the map function where we uh, have to pass the two validations. And then if both are correct, we are able to initialize a person. But the semantics of uh, validated are a, a bit different compared to either. In this case, uh, we are not uh, failing fast. We are able to continue performing validations and accumulating all the errors. So the final result will be it, uh, the, a valid person if everything was uh, right, or all the errors that we had during the validation process. So yeah. This is an example of uh, having code that uh, we can somehow abstract, but the type system does not allow us to do because Swift only allows us to abstract over these things that are the type arguments of a type. But we cannot uh, uh, abstract over the type that contains them. Okay, so essentially you want to, you, like, like instead of, copy and paste in the code, which, you know, is what I would have done to create these two files, essentially change validated to some extra argument, somehow uh, some F or some uh, validator container, whatever you want to call it. And then we just don't have to write the code. It actually, it's the type system we tested for. Okay, interesting, interesting. Exactly. Even we could even go farther because 
now he, here we are just asking about two different semantics when we are dealing with errors, but we could need to to use, for instance, um, result, which is a data type that is provided by the uh, Swift standard library, just because the rest of the code that we have in our code base is using results or many other different uh, types. So we uh, would still have the exact same uh, structure in the body of these functions and just changing the names of the constructors that we use to represent the fail uh, case or the success case. So this is what we could achieve if we had higher than kind of types. We could somehow say that this validated type is not fixed, but it is a generic type. And then we can construct uh, values of this type using uh, um, some uh, function to create uh, errors and some functions to create uh, valid values. And this is what uh, we try to uh, address with uh, Bo. Okay, so, uh, I mean, this, this example clearly, well, this for me, it, it shows that you might want to abstract this, but I don't know, do you have any more examples? So apart from, from the fact that you can fail with different things, I don't know, what, what other kind of thing could, could use these higher kind of types? We could be using it to abstract over the, um, over the effects that uh, something is uh, having. For instance, we could be representing um, our side effects as streams and we could be uh, generating some kind of library where we don't want to commit to a specific uh, effect type. For instance, you may be using streams for uh, from Rx Swift, or you may be using streams from the combined framework in, in Apple, and you want your library to work in both platforms. So right now, the only possible way you can deal with this is creating two different uh, integrations of your library with whatever uh, uh, library you want to be compatible with. Okay, so, so, so this, this is giving us like more modularity, so less less dependency, less direct dependency on, on stuff. Then. Exactly. It, it uh, helps you remove some sort of duplication in your code and making your uh, your library much more powerful because you are not committing to a specific implementation. You can use whatever implementation you want, even some implementations that you don't know about. Okay, so I mean, now now that you've told me all of this, I'm actually, I mean, I see there are, there is one file you haven't shown us, which I guess it's how this looks in Bo. So, but but before that, you've you've mentioned that that that. Uh, Swift doesn't have higher kind of types, but Bo uses higher kind of types. So uh, how, how do you do that? I mean, how, how, how is that possible at all? Well, there, there is uh, an interesting paper that I recommend everyone to read, which is uh, titled, if I remember correctly, uh, Lightweight Higher Kinded Polymorphism by Jeremy Yallop and Leo White. And that it describes that uh, if your language supports generics, like the typical generics that we know about, we can use this to somehow simulate uh, higher kind of types using some uh, a special trick. Uh, I saw this trick implemented in, in Arrow, which is the uh, sibling library from Bo. Uh, for bringing functional programming to Kotlin, and I tried to implement it in, in Swift. So essentially it's uh, leveraging the generics power to simulate higher candidate types. And I have to say simulate because we don't have the full power as we would have if this feature was native to the language. But still, I have been able to build a ton of stuff on top of this uh, simulation. So it's quite powerful. Nice. So I think it's, it's time you show us how this yeah. this looks. Yeah. So we can 
go to this uh, new file where I am creating a, a class called higher validation. And if you remember from the previous two examples, we didn't have any parameter here because we were committing to a specific type. We were committing to either or to validate it. Okay. So here we are uh, saying that uh, our uh, validation is going to work over a generic type F. And here I am telling that this F needs to have some requirements. In this case, is the applicative error type class. So applicative error is a type class which is represented in Swift as a protocol that lets me work with uh, uh, errors or successful values, uh, just as I was needing in the previous example. And there is one more clause here. And I'm saying that uh, the error type that uh, we are having that we are dealing with inside this f type is of type validation error otherwise i won't be able to represent values of the specific error type that i am handling in my functions okay so so here okay. this f is essentially what it's abstracting from either or validation this is you know the extra parameter you have there the the, the changes Exactly. So right now, if I see my function for validating uh, um, the name or the age, it is returning kind of f and a string. So this is where the magic happens. I had to come up with this kind uh, structure, which is what lets me abstract over the, the container type. So essentially, this is like kind of f uh, and a string is uh, abstracting over some having something like f of a string. Okay, and that okay. that's that's the simulation part. So you are essentially you this. cannot write f of a string. So you come up with this different encoding using kind. Exactly. So as I am not able to uh, type this straight in Swift, I had to come up with a, a, a structure called kind that has the left hand side of the generic and the right the, the inner part of the generic. So now, for instance, if I am abstracting over either uh, of a validation error and a string, so this means that uh, my f is somehow either of validation error, right? Because the f the f part uh, is everything else but the last part, the string. Okay, but I cannot type exactly this because either needs two type parameters and I'm only passing one. So uh, the, the other part of the simulation is that I have created partially applied types. So this means that I can, if I have either that needs two parameters, I can omit the last one by using the either partial version. So whatever partial version that I have, is the same as the type, but omitting the last parameter. So this lets me use uh, this uh, kind of F something where I am using F without the last uh, type argument and then the last type argument. So that's, that's the, the same trick essentially as you play when you write programs and then you say, well, a function with two arguments is like a function with one argument, which then takes yet another argument, right? Exactly, it's a, it's like the curry operation in functions, but applied to types. So likewise, I can do the same thing with uh, the validated type, right? Because I previously I had validated of validation error and a string, and this means that my f should be something like a validated partial of a validation error. Also notice that uh, here I was using the clause where to indicate that my f somehow has to have the notion of validation error, which is here in the partially applicated uh, version of the type. Okay, so essentially now either partial validated partial are gonna be what 
we substitute by f when we want to make this more exactly. concrete, right? Yes. So now when I, whenever I invoke this higher validation with uh, a proper f that meets these requirements, meaning that it is able to work as an applicative error and it has a validation error as the error type that it knows how to handle, we can invoke all these functions. So let's continue down here. And yeah, our validation of the age is exactly the same. And instead of using the specific names that we had before for left and right or valid and invalid, we can use these generic uh, functions to create values of, uh, of the successful uh, side or from the failure side. So we use race error whenever we want to create an error of uh, whatever type f that we are uh, using here, or we can use pure to create the successful value. So this gives us a homogeneous way of uh, dealing with values of any type f, as long as we know that this type f is able to represent successful and failure val values. I see. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. So so. Uh, after that, we need to be able to uh, create a person from both uh, validations, right? Mm -hmm. So now we need the map function. And it turns out that any applicative error already uh, states that it is able to work with a, a map function. So we just have to uh, invoke this with the type that we are returning. Remember that before we were returning an either or a validated, and this was what we were mm -hmm. uh, using here. But now we are using a generic uh, F type. So the way we can do that is using the simulation with kind of F and uh, person, which is the final value that we are returning. And the semantics will be the semantics of the type that we end up using. Mm -hmm. This means that if we choose f as either, then this will fail fast, returning only the, fail, the first error that we found. And if f is uh, um, a validation, validation, so we will get all the uh, error, uh, all, all the errors that happen during the validation process. Okay, okay. So interesting. I mean. Uh... I mean, this to me that there doesn't seem to be that much of a change apart from like replacing the things with, with kind. Other than that, I mean, and, and the change of name, which I guess it's something you need to do to come up with new generic names. So yeah, it's, it's like if you implement a uh, sort for different types with different names, uh, you end up with a situation where you cannot sort generically. Mm -hmm. But if you come up with a protocol that uh, states how uh, the sorting function is called, uh, then you can use a sort for whatever structure you know that can be sorted. So it's uh, something like that. Okay, so, so something that now I'm wondering, because I know that, that Swift has been evolving, so I think it's now like release 5 or something like this, right? Yeah, we so, are waiting uh, for release 5.3. Do you happen to know whether there are some, some ideas to bring this kind of, kind of uh, you know, this, this feature into the language? Yes, there there is some interest. In, uh, there is some interest in uh, bringing this into Swift as a, as a feature. There is a document called the Generics Manifesto where um, there is a sort of roadmap into uh, how to bring all these things into the table. But uh, there are some uh, some issues uh, regarding this because most types in Swift that uh, are dealing with errors have the arguments in the opposite side as we have shown here. Uh, this means that uh, if we try to do partial application from left to right, this uh, means that the rightmost argument is the error and not the, the value that we are handling. Oh, so it's, it's, this it's, means that the, it's interesting yeah, the, the, how such a 
seemingly innocuous thing that they did in the past could actually, you know, show 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 like this later if you try to do something. Exactly, but I think this does not mean uh, that does not need to be a, 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 an obstacle to bring this feature. Um, they could think of uh, a different way of uh, telling which parameter is the one that you want to transform with uh, whatever type class you are implementing or whatever uh, generic function you are doing and, and then just uh, including that into the language. I guess it will be more difficult, but this is because the way I have implemented this and the way that this feature is typically implemented in most uh, languages is highly influenced by how this is done in Haskell because Haskell does this partial application from left to right. And I think it was uh, a very sensible thing to do. But now, if you have a previous inheritance of uh, decisions that you you made into your library or into your standard library in your language, and this needs to keep compatibility with uh, whatever you did in the past, um, yeah, you, you need to come up with a different way of uh, bringing higher candidate types. Yeah, so, I've, 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 uh... I I felt this. I I you know when I when I read Haskell, there are sometimes where you need to to swap arguments, and that's that's it's its own business. There is a whole business to do this. Nice. So so I think uh, well you've I mean we've now delved into this kind of more technical part, but but maybe you know let's let's try to 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 go back with a, for a more distended talk and uh, yeah something I wanted to to talk because you know you've you've brought this. Uh, I see you. You brought uh, higher kind of types, and and uh, well, clearly in 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 both there is things like applicatives and things like this. So, so I was I was wondering what what other kind of things from functional programming do you think that that could still become like a mainstream thing? What what other kind of things you would like to see uh, being being in more use? Yeah, one thing that I have seen uh, brought to Swift and not too many languages is optics. Optics is a way of uh, dealing with uh, uh, deep, deeply nested data structures uh, in a more uh, transparent way. If you have uh, worked with uh, immutable uh, data types, you uh, have probably felt the need of uh, modifying something that is uh, like several levels inside the uh, data structure. And as things are immutable, you have to start making copies uh, manually of all the levels until you uh, reach the point where you want to modify something. And this has some troubles because you end up having uh, to manually uh, traverse the the structure, and if it ever changes, then you have to go through all these things again. Yeah, I I, I I've I've seen some scholars have this copy copy copy, or or in Haskell that that's sort of the same. So in, indeed, that's that tends to be a pain if you want to go, you know, full immutability. Yeah, so there is a very nice way of dealing with the, those situations, and this is uh, optics and in particular lenses. And I was amazed to see that uh, Swift already includes this. This is, this is uh, included under a different name and not with the canonical implementation that you can see in uh, in other languages like in Scala or in in uh, Haskell. They are called key paths, and they are a way of uh, accessing a generic property of a data type. And the good thing is that you can compose them, so you can access the deeply nested uh, field that you want to modify, and using these key paths, you can seamlessly change them. And the other annoying part of, uh, of uh, optics is writing them yourself or yeah, or having to use some sort of uh, generation to get all the optics for all the fields, for all the data types that you're working on. So this is something that uh, Swift already provides out of the box. So you can easily get a, a key path to any property. And this is a feature that I haven't seen in many languages. 
So uh, I, I would like to see uh, features like this uh, implemented in, in uh, other languages because they are really useful. Yeah, let's, let's hope this kind of ideas, you know, you said permeate into, into more languages. Well, so I think, I mean, I think, I think uh, you've, you've taught us a lot today. I mean, uh, you know, apart from the ideas of, of how Swift is becoming this, this functional language, also we, we've learned a lot about, about higher kind of types. Uh, so, so thanks for that. And well, I'll say that's, that's, that's all for today. Thanks, thanks, Tomas, for being with us. Thank you. And yeah, uh, after that, uh, hopefully soon we will we'll also announce who's gonna be the our next guest in Immutable Conversations, and I will actually next time open the mics to everybody listening to us, so you can also uh, send us questions or or you know communicate with us, so so you know what what you wanna hear from us. So thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and see you next time.